All right, well, while we're getting our Bibles out and getting over to Genesis uh, chapter 11, uh, I just want to say, if you don't have a Bible or if you're looking for something maybe a little nicer than the typical paper Bibles that we give away, uh, Jack brought in a whole stack of Bibles that used to be in his family. Some of them are leather-bound, a few different translations, and those are all on the counter in the front office right here upstairs. So if you would maybe like to do a little Bible upgrade or looking for maybe a study Bible or a little pocket Bible, I just want to let you know we have a stack of those that are in that office. You're more than welcome to just take them and do with them what you will. Uh, because I really would love to see more Bibles in church. You know, I know we, make, we put it up on the screen to make it easy for you, but there's no substitute for knowing the Word of God, knowing how to find things in the Word of God and having a copy of it at home to study and read. So um, I just want to encourage you to if you bring your Bibles to church. You know, uh, maybe next week when you bring your income tax tithe to church. Should we tithe off of our income tax returns? What do you think? Yes, of course we should. All right. It's funny, last year, you know, the, the, the uh, bookkeeper said, you know, we haven't really gotten any, oh, hardly any, hardly any, uh, you know, tithes off of people's tax returns. And, and then a bunch of people said to me, well, I did, well, I did, well, I did. And I'm like, I don't really know. I don't really, let's do that this year. Because uh, I'll tell you, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we are interested in, in getting some new TVs. Uh, I know these are small things. These are not consequential to the ministry of the word. However, these TVs are starting to wig out because they're really old and they're giving us fits. Uh, they're not smart TVs. And, and so uh, you know, we often have to turn them off and return them on to get them to look right. And, and it's just time to upgrade these TVs. And again, I know it's a small thing. Thankfully, the price of TVs has gone down. Uh, we also want to upgrade this lighting up here because the band has informed me that they're sick and tired of this lighting them, uh, making them blind on Sundays. Uh, and, and it is. It's, it's ridiculous. So uh, we want to do something different with this lighting to, to make it still look good up on the stage but not be blinding our poor worship team. So, you know, there's some things that we want to do uh, around the church. And so uh, income tax is a uh, return time is a great chance for the church to maybe get that little extra uh, to be able to do a couple projects like that, you know. So... I uh, just want to encourage you to be faithful in that. If you're new here, if it's your first time here, that announcement was not for you, okay? <laughs> that is just for people who, who believe in tithing, who call this their home church, and who give regularly. Uh, we just want to be faithful. Um, so, and thank you, Cindy, for that, that testimony of, of God's faithfulness. When we are faithful to him, he is always faithful to us, you know? So as most of you know, uh, I like to teach through entire books of the Bible. Uh, I don't know, it's just what I prefer to do. A lot of pastors preach topical sermons, and I really like taking us through the entire Word of God, because then you end up going through some things that a lot of people miss, or that rarely get preached on in church, and, and so recently we've been going through the book of Genesis, and I know some of you might think, wow, that's going to take the whole year. It, it, it may seem that way, but it's only been a few weeks, and we're already in chapter 11. We're, we're not going to, you know, read chapters that says, he beget him, and he beget him, and he beget him, and things like that. And there are going to be some things that we're going to kind of pass over that are really, really familiar, just to, to be able to get through the book of Genesis. But we're in the book of Genesis. The word Genesis just means beginnings, the start of things, right? So it's a book of beginnings. We read about the beginning of creation. We read about... We were introduced to the first people, Adam and Eve. We read about the first wedding. We read about the first sin. We read about the first children of men and women, Cain and Abel. We read about then the first murder. Genesis is a book of beginnings. It's a book of firsts. And, and as we get to chapter 11 this morning, we're going to learn about a new beginning. Not just a beginning, but a new beginning. A restoration that happens later, really happens not in the book of Genesis, happens later, but it's part and it's connected to a judgment that we're going to read about in chapter 11 here in the city which came to be known as Babel. Now, just as with the story of Noah, if you're familiar with that story, again, we, we didn't really go through the whole story of Noah last week. We referred to it. We talked about it a little bit, but... Just as with the story of Noah, where God judges the whole earth with a flood, you know, it's, it's a hard story to read, this story about Babel. It's just like that. It's a hard story to read because you're reading about judgment because there's, a, there's so much harsh reality here that we're reading about. As mankind, the Bible says, grows from worse to worse to worse, gets more and more sinful, more and more rebellious, more and more stubborn, and then God's forced to intervene. And so he does intervene. Well, what I want you to see this morning is 
The reason for his intervention is not just to punish people, it's not just to bring judgment, but it's so that ultimately he can restore his people. So I hope you'll see that, that even amidst the judgment and the harsh realities and the harsh lessons that we're going to read about, and I'm going to say this over and over and over again this morning, our God is a God of restoration. And this morning, if, if you need restoration, whatever's going on in your life, if you need restoration this morning, if you need God's help, if you need to come back to the Lord or need to get right with Him in the first place, you're going to have an opportunity at the end of service today to come forward to this altar and we're going to pray for God's hand of restoration to be manifest in your life. And I realized that as I was saying that, it's kind of unusual, isn't it, for, for a preacher to preview what's going to happen at the end of service, like I just said for today. But what I often find during times of your know, altar calls or altar ministry, whatever you want to call it, is that there's often this wall of pride that seems to crop up with people that kind of gets in the way from, from people responding. And sometimes that takes a little while to break down and overcome. So I thought I would just share it with you right up front this morning. I'm going to call you to the altar later. So start dealing with that wall right now. God wants to break that wall down, and he wants to penetrate our hearts and minister to us. So this morning, I just want to get you thinking about that wall. Because, listen, the only way to make any kind of forward progress in your spiritual life is to break that wall down and allow the God of restoration to come in and do what he does. So let's pray this morning as we begin. Father, as we begin this morning, if somebody's at the door and it appears to be locked, if someone could just go ahead and open that back door, I would appreciate it. There, someone's got it. Someone's got it. Thank you. Thank you. Father, this morning as we open your word, as I always do, I ask you, God, to open our hearts. But Lord, some, for some of us, there's a, there's a wall between you and between our hearts. Because there's some things that are going on in our lives or in our hearts that we either don't want to let you in to fix or we don't want to acknowledge are really issues. So we have these walls. And Father, we, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and his influence and his softening that those walls would begin to break down and dissolve this morning. That as your word comes, it would come and penetrate the hardness of our hearts, minister to our hearts, and help us to see where we need to let you in to do what only you can do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 11, starting right at verse 1, reads this way. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. It says, now the whole world had one language and the same words. And I want you to think about why that is, right? So you have Noah, you have his family, there's just eight people in the ark. God saves that family. They all speak the same language. So presumably this is the language of Noah and his family. Ancient historians, a lot of them believe it was Hebrew. No one really knows, but they have one language here. And it says, and as people, this is Noah's family, migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And what it's talking about is it's talking about a land somewhere east of the Euphrates River. That, that was what they considered the east back in those days. And, and this possibly where the Magi who came to visit Christ at his birth came from, many speculate. So some of them end up migrating to the land of Babylon, or it was eventually called Babylon, in the region of Shinar. And that's like a desert plain. I, I heard uh, Mark Driscoll this week describe it as sort of like Arizona, you know. It's just a desert, it's flat, um, and this is the area that's now known as modern-day Iraq. And so it says here in verse 3, and, as they, they, and they said to one another, come... Let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And, and so what I want you to see here in this uh, two sentences is that they had some memory of the flood. How do I know that? Well, because they began to make waterproof bricks. Bitumen was like tar. It was a substance that was, they, they believed was kind of waterproof. And what they did is they baked these bricks really thoroughly so that they became hard like stone. You know, thinking back to the, the things that they saw built and the things they participated in the building of in Egypt, for example, where they were making blocks of stone and piling them up and they were super strong. But they had a memory of the flood. So they thought to themselves, we probably ought to make our stuff waterproof just in case another flood comes. 
But what we're going to see is that though they have a memory of the flood, they don't have a memory of the promise. Remember that promise? God said he would set the rainbow in the sky to remind people that he would never destroy the earth again with what? A flood, right? They don't seem to have a memory of the promise, but they have a memory of the flood. They had essentially forgotten the decrees of the Lord. They had forgotten his word, and as a result, they find themselves now, once again, just as in the days of Noah, steeped in all sorts of wickedness and sin and going, and going from bad to worse. So, so it says they made waterproof bricks, and they're so hard, even though they're clay, that they're, they're, they're like stone, they're thoroughly baked, and they're covered in this thick pitch. Some people describe it as an ancient form of asphalt, they're, and they also used it for mortar. It, and it isn't, isn't it amazing, when you think about this, that a people who have some, you know, like remaining historical knowledge, they, clearly this is somewhat familiar, they still remember something about this worldwide flood Right? They, after all, they come from that family and that, that heritage, that lineage. Isn't it amazing to me that people who retain that knowledge have the arrogance to believe that they can somehow construct a defense against God should he choose to judge them again? I, the, the, the flood was worldwide. It covered the tops of the mountains. And they think they can construct a defense against another flood should God decide to judge the earth again. The arrogance is astounding here. In fact, the historian Herodotus was not a Bible historian. He was just a contemporary of the age who lived during the waning period or the waning years of the Babylonian Empire. He wrote about the splendor of Babylon. What an amazing place it was. And he described its walls that were constructed, the walls that we're talking about here. And Herodotus tells us that the city was surrounded by uh, enormous walls, and I'm going to describe these in just a second, built by Hammurabi. And, and, and to understand the scale of these walls that Hammurabi had built, the city itself, I want you to just think about its sheer size, was about 200 square miles. It's about the size of Chicago. It's the size of this city. So it's a pretty big wall to go all the way around that city. And Herodotus tells us that the walls around Babylon were about 300 feet high. It's a pretty big wall, right? But here's the more amazing part. They were about 87 feet thick. And you may have heard about this. They were so thick that the Babylonians could actually hold chariot races on top of the walls. And Herodotus tells us that those walls could accommodate six chariots wide to do those races on that wall. I mean, think about the enormity the amount of bricks, the amount of bitumen. And it was considered by everyone in those days to be a basically impenetrable city. You're not getting in Babylon, but here's the really arrogant part. God isn't getting in Babylon either. And their impudence, as we're going to see, didn't stop at the wall. The wall was just the, the first part of, of, of what they found so amazing. Then they set out to build a giant tower. You've heard of this, right? The Tower of, of Babel. And it really was, was modeled after what was known at the time as a ziggurat temple. And what that was was a temple dedicated to a false god named Marduk, and he was considered to be the patron god, the patron god of Babylon. Okay? And they said in verse 4, Come, let us build ourselves a city... And a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And there's, there's two things that, that really stand out here. Number one is the obvious, right? This is the pride of a people who, although they might remember something about a flood wiping people out, they have forgotten God's righteous judgments, as well as his promises, They've forgotten all that. Not only do they think they can defend against a judgment with the bitumen, right? They're so prideful that they think they're smarter and more powerful than God. I mean, so much so, they think they can thwart any attempt by God to judge them again. And they think they can prevent God from dispersing them the way the world was dispersed after the flood. And this is utter foolishness. 
I mean, if you want to really just kind of dial it down to the simplest principle, they essentially stopped believing in the power of God and they started to believe in their own legend. It got me thinking about this bumper sticker I saw early this past week. I got behind this car. By the way, bumper stickers, oh, every week I see some sort of crazy bumper sticker that just deeply offends me as a person of faith. This one was special. It said, in the beginning, man created God. That was the whole bumper sticker. Just, a, just an outright stab at the Christian faith and people of faith. And what occurred to me as I was reading that bumper sticker and thinking about a drive-by shooting, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You got to love the sinner. You really do. No, what I really thought to myself was, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. That's the word. Scripture says the fool, the foolish, the unwise, the arrogant, the prideful, the stubborn, have said in their heart, there's no God. And I felt sad because this utter foolishness to venerate man above God. Because to do so really reveals that you don't even believe there is a God. For if you did, you would fear him. The second thing that stands out here when we read this is that this is a people who are ultimately you could describe as just defiant. I mean, even for those of them who would say, yeah, we, we believe in God, but they're defiant. What I mean by that is God tells them after the flood, what does he say? He says, go, spread out, be fruitful, and multiply, right? So if you're going to be fruitful and multiply, you need to spread out. You have to make room for that to happen, to make room for more of God's creation. But the people were defiant. They said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to fulfill God's purposes for mankind. We are going to rise above God and make a name for who? Ourselves. They were defiant. We're going to do it our way, they said, not God's way. But how many of you know that that sort of flagrant, flagrant chutzpah, like we talked about last week, it doesn't play very well with the Lord, does it? Look what it says in verse 5. And the Lord came down. That's always bad. <laughs> right? That's like Tommy hearing my footsteps come down the steps when I hear my wife yelling at him. He knows dad's coming down to take care of business. Right? It says, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children had ma uh, of man had built. And he probably giggled like, that's so cute. Oh, these people are adorable. I love that symbolism, though. He came down. I love that symbolism. As if God actually needed to lower himself to come down and see what his rebellious kids were doing. God could have said, uh, this is beneath me. I, I don't need to even deal with these people. I know what's going on. And he could have destroyed them with the snap of his finger. After all, God said he wouldn't kill people with a flood, but he didn't say anything about an earthquake or a volcano or any other number of disasters that he could have brought, and he would have been completely just in doing so. But he doesn't. That's what you need to see this morning. He doesn't. He instead lowers himself and measures out fair judgment to these people who don't deserve it. And he takes the time to metaphorically come down to rebuke them for the sake of future generations. Why? Because our God is a God of restoration. What, what's happening here is God is revealing in this account of the Tower of Babel, amidst, you know, all the righteous judgment and all that other stuff, that he's actually a very merciful father. We'll see that in a moment, but, but first, verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Now, let me just ask you a question. Do you think they really could have beaten God? 
So that can't be what it means. What God is simply saying here is, if they'll rebel in this way, there is no end to the type of rebellion they are capable of. That's what he's saying. Right? Obviously, nobody can build a tower that, that reaches the heavens. But what this speaks to is, is, is what I refer to as the slippery slope that many people find themselves on when they endeavor to redefine reality instead of submitting to God's definition of life. In other words, one thing, if left unchecked, leads to another. Right? It's the old adage. What happens if you leave a child alone? He or she gets into what? Trouble. One thing leads to another. If we allow this, then this will happen. If we allow this, then this will naturally happen as a result. And the argument when trying to justify something that's clearly wrong is this. Oh, you're just crazy. Of course that won't happen. It won't lead to a slippery slope. Right? That's always the argument. Don't worry, they tell us. Uh, if we let men marry men, uh, if we let women marry women, it'll stop there. It won't go any further than that. It, it won't turn into the perversion you religious people seem to be so incredibly paranoid about. You people are crazy. It's not going to turn into that. There's no such thing as the slippery slope. It's paranoid to think that these ideologies will lead to other things. That's the argument. But all you have to do is look at the acronym being used to create today's definitions. See, now, in my young adulthood, there was just gay and lesbian, right? The L and the G. That, that's all there was. It's just, it was easy to understand. There's the L and the G. It's what boys do and what girls do, Okay? And then it turned into the LGB to add bisexuality to the whole thing, to, to, to this acronym, to this list, which was really groundbreaking societally because it was the first time that society began to accept a non-binary view of sexuality. I'm not talking about gender. I'm talking about who you can be with. So let's say that in case there's any kids remaining. I just had to explain a lot of this to my son this week because he finally got to that place where we're reading the scripture and he wants to know what they're talking about. So I had to share with him some of the acronyms and, and this was groundbreaking because you know what? You don't have to pick one or the other now. This was new. Now you can just do whatever you want with whoever you want anytime you want. Then they added the T for transgender. Now you can not only choose whatever it is you want to do, listen to this, you can choose whatever you want to be. This was, again, another groundbreaking redefinition. And it took the, uh, things a step further because instead of only defining like preferences, like I prefer to be with this kind of person or I prefer to be with this kind of person, it began to encourage people to define them, their very selves, their very nature, the very form with which they were created to, to be according to, not God's design, but according to their own wishes and ideas. And it really, if you think about it, it's just a further slippery slope. It is a further redefinition. It's a further moving away from God's design. Remember when I said this? Listen, if Satan can corrupt our view of how we were created to be, he can then corrupt our, corrupt our view of why we were created to be. I've said that a lot recently. If he can corrupt our view of how we were created to be, he can corrupt our view of why we were created to be. And, and this is exactly what's happening because it didn't stop there. They added the Q. Those of you who don't know what the Q is, that's for queer or questioning. And this refers to those who are either unsure of their sexual identity or maybe they consider themselves fluid. They can kind of be a man one day, be a woman the next day, be neither the third day. It doesn't really matter. And then that means they can be whatever they want. They can be with whoever they want. And they can do whatever they want, right? To be fluid means you can redefine yourself at any time according to what... Does this sound familiar? Does this sound like the people of Babel? We will make a name for who? Ourselves. 
You can define yourself at any time according to what you feel, what you want. Not what God feels, not what God wants, not what God has designed or created. What you feel, what you want at any given moment. And we wonder why this generation is so confused. But they didn't stop there, they added the I. Which should have never been added, right? Because there's no slippery slope. That's not a thing, it's just religious paranoia. But somehow they added the I for intersex, meaning that if you were born with, some, with any kind of physical abnormality, no matter how minor, no matter how unrelated is, it, it is to your actual gender, you can go ahead and just consider yourself someone who kind of straddles between the two. Right? Then there's the plus. This is actually the most concerning, the plus. This is the most worrisome because it opens the door wide open for a complete redefinition of humanity. Again, further from what God created. That's the plan. That's the idea. Because it means that you can be anything else you decide. You can be a cat. You can be a dog. You can be an alien. You can be whatever you want according to your desires. Why? Because there is no order of creation designed by an omniscient creator. God is no longer now a concern. And, and, and let me make no mistake, because I, I, I told you a long time ago, I'd always speak the truth, and I would never pull any punches, and if you don't like it, there's churches on every street corner. Let me just tell you, the primary reason for the plus is because those who find themselves attracted to children know how unpalatable it would be to put an M in the acronym. So don't be fooled. The M is in the plus. There is now a push that's becoming more and more open for a definition of something called minor attracted persons. They still don't want to add it to the acronym yet because they know how most people would react, but it's coming. And this would be considered an acceptable choice. Why? Because there is no order of creation. What do we see here? Just by looking at the acronym alone, one thing always leads to another. And people who, who cut God out of the equation always descend 100% of the time into darkness and chaos. And I just want to say this before moving on, and I, I'm, this isn't a sermon on this topic really, but just before moving on from this particular uh, point, notice that God said in this passage, they are all one people and they have one language. Language is a big deal here in this story. Because today's alphabet movement of, of redefining everything, it's all about creating a new language. And what they do is they, they use shame and societal pressure to try to get everybody, even Christians, to speak that language. Because if they can get everybody speaking it, they can get everybody accepting it. If they can get everybody accepting it because they speak it, they can get everybody promoting it. So let me encourage you this morning, don't speak Satan's language. Don't do it. You know, I, I no longer refer to anything called the LGBT community. I used to use that phrase because that's a popular way to describe this because it sounds very innocuous and loving. And, and these are our friends, and, right? right? They're the community of these people. You know what? It's not a community. You know what it is? It's a godless, demonic conspiracy to brainwash your children and define and redefine God's creation. That's what it is. And let me tell you something. The use of the word community has infected churches who then become complicit in redefining the things God has said. And that's sinister. And it really breaks the heart of God that people who identify with this demonic alphabet in this way, they're so deceived. And that's the balance, right? We, we, we have to love people. But we shouldn't be so worried about offending people with God's truth that we become willing to use demonic false terminologies. This is not our vernacular, and it is an affront to the Lord. It is an abomination to Him. It is a perversion of His divine order of creation. 
Now, again, for some balance, it doesn't mean you need to go out of your way to create confrontation, but neither should Christians be forced to conform and use perverse language. Right? I mean, this is all about speaking the truth, but speaking it in love. And speaking it, even when it's harsh, because we love. And this generation right now needs to hear the truth. Because they're not free. We don't hate them. I didn't get an amen on that one. You, you all need to come to the altar in a minute. I'm getting all these other amens about how bad they are, but I'm not getting any amens about how much we need to love them. And We'll be opening the altars in a second for all, for all y'all, but... God wants to set them free. These are his children. Lest we see God's judgment in this generation the way Babylon did. Right? So, as in the days of Babel, this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. There will be no limits to what they're going to say is okay. And the idea here, listen, as, as well, I, I want to show you kind of this from another angle is that when man makes technological progress, right, and, and that's where we are as a, as, a, as, a, as a world right now, right? We are in a time right now of, of some of the greatest technical, 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 wow, I should have had a second coffee, technological progress in human history, right? Thinking about computers and AI and all that other kind of stuff, the technology, it's just really increasing rapidly. And the idea here is just like in the time of, of Babylon, right, such as the building of this great city. It was a big technological, te oh my gosh. <laughs> it was a big technological miracle. Get it? Big advancement here. It was this big, what great city with these amazing walls. It was big advancement technologically, but without moral progress. So they had the technology without the morals without the ethics. They had one form of progress without a different form of progress, which is the moral, ethical, spiritual side of their progress. And when that happens, when we have a sudden increase in technology, but we don't have an increase of morality and spirituality, what happens? The same thing that always happens, that we read about in the Scripture over and over and over again. The state of man quickly descends into deeper levels of darkness and perversion and rebellion and stubbornness. Let me give you a modern day example of this. This past week, Apple released its new Vision Pro. Anybody see the Vision Pro or commercials for that on TV? One, two people. Okay, great. Well, then let me kind of, I wasn't going to explain it to you, but apparently I need to. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, they call it spatial computing. And basically what it is, it's like these goofy looking ski goggle type things you put on. Uh, and they're basically a form of visual uh, reality, VR. It's a visual environment, a virtual environment that you can control by just moving your hands around or by moving your eyes around, right? You can surf the internet. You can immerse yourself in virtual reality. You can do all sorts of things with it. And um, to be sure, it's, it's amazing technology. It, it is. It's, it's quite an advancement in technology. And it can have a lot of positive uses uh, in society that I could think of, although the potential dangers and negatives, I believe, far outweigh the potential benefits of this sort of technology. For example, as is the big concern with the metaverse, if you know what that is, this, this is something that, that Meta, which is Facebook, has been trying to do for the last few years. They came out with something kind of similar, um, and, and it's already being heavily criticized as a mechanism that's become tailor-made to push more perverse and immersive forms and addictive forms of pornography on culture. And many in the tech world, and I'm not even talking Christians, many in the tech world are already saying that this might end up being its primary use with young people. Because it, it, it will quickly become a place, right, where people can act out their darkest fantasies in this really believable, realistic virtual environment. Immoral fantasies, illegal fantasies, criminal fantasies, murderous, violent, whatever in a virtual world without any accountability or any sort of consequences. And I imagine that this will quickly devolve into young men and women growing more and more confused about what is reality and what is not. 
And some of you think that'll never happen. And many of us made that same argument about violent video games. But we know now, think things like Columbine, that many people do become addicted to these. And they bring that addiction into the real world, bringing very real consequences to our society and culture. And I bring this up to just give you an example of people advancing technologically, I'm getting good at the word now, technologically, but actually devolving spiritually and morally. The advancement of one creates the devolving of the other. And this seems to always be the pattern with mankind in general. The whole Bible is like a big, giant list of these examples. Right? The smarter we get, or the smarter we, we think we are, okay, the less moral and less far we tend to get from God as a people. And it seems as if there's no end to how bad we can get from generation to generation. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> Is this encouraging or what? I know. It, it gets better. But not yet. God judges, verse 7. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, there are three judgments actually described here in this paragraph. The first judgment was to confuse their speech. That's the obvious one. That's the one everybody remembers. If they can't speak the same language, if they're unable to communicate, can you imagine right now if the internet disappeared? I know you, some of you would be excited, <laughs> but can you imagine? Can you imagine if the internet just disappeared today, how difficult it would be to communicate with many of the people that we currently communicate with? If they cannot speak the same language and understand one another, you know what follows, right? Is total societal and economic breakdown, which is what happens here in Babel. The second judgment was to end the prideful work of building the monument to their own vanity. It says in the work of building the city and the tower, it all stopped. Because they couldn't even communicate. We must never forget the warnings about pride throughout the scripture because pride is at the heart of most of what drives people into sin, right? Because as we read, pride says there's no God. Pride says I know better than God, hence I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do this my own way. I mean, every justification we make to avoid obeying God's word is rooted in pride. Because can I be real this morning with you? God's word ain't that hard. I mean, quite frankly, it's easier to figure out how to obey God than to justify reasons for not following what he said. So here's a clue for you. Uh, so you can know whether or not you're justifying something, right? If you've come up with some sort of like philosophical framework for your quote-unquote take on the commands of Scripture, you're justifying you know, it's okay, to, it's okay to sleep together because, you know, we're going to get married and God knows that and he knows we're committed, right? No, it's not. It's not okay. From Moses on, we have civil marriage. God created civil marriage and civil divorce. This is a thing that is recognized and ordained by God. So what you feel doesn't matter. Oh, it's okay to watch porn because, you know, I'm not really physically committing adultery with, with another one. I'm just looking at, you know, images, not real people. No, it's not. Jesus said that to look at another woman lustfully is adultery, but you're just looking at images. Have you ever noticed how much God says about images? What do you say in the Ten Commandments? Don't make images for yourself and worship them. Images count, in other words. Well, this one you're not going to like. Uh, it's okay to, to 
you know, not to financially give because I'm, yeah, I'm giving my time to the church. So I'm, I'm like tithing that way. No. I'm sorry, but the Bible is clear. You can't serve both God and money. How about I bring it a little closer to home and really make you mad at me? It's okay to neglect my family because I'm working long hours to provide for them. No. The Bible clearly tells us it's family, God. No. God, family, and what's at the bottom of the list? Church. God, family, church. God, family, church. Work, of course, is mixed up into the family component, but it's God, family, church. I almost hate to wake you up to that reality because I need more of you working in church. <laughs> but listen, a father's primary ministry is to who? His family. That's why it's God, family, church. A father's primary, a husband's primary ministry is to who? His wife. You are called to be the priest of your home. Here's another one. I don't need to honor my parents because I'm 18. You know, the Bible never says that when you reach a certain age or place in life that it's suddenly okay to live toward anybody in dishonor, especially toward your parents. There's no expiration date, kids, for honoring. These are, are all just like philosophical frameworks people come up with, excuses that people come up with, but the scripture is actually really plain about these issues, right? And, and, and many others. It's really simple. We must not allow our pride to convince us that we know more than the plain reading of God's word. You know when I'm done counseling somebody? When they start arguing with God's word. I guess we're done. And you know what? I would say more than half of my counseling that I do with people gets to that place. More than half. Where I'm sharing with them the plain understanding of God's word, the plain reading of God's word, which is very simple. What has been made known to man has been made what? Plain? It's not that hard? And they start arguing with a million and one reasons why, well, that's a misinterpretation or a misunderstanding. And they start coming up with these philosophical frameworks. And I say usually something along these lines, well, I guess we're finished. I guess you've got this all figured out. And I guess I'll just be here to help pick up the pieces later. We can't allow our pride to convince us that we know more than the plain reading of God's word. First judgment is on their language. The second judgment is, is on what they were building. The third judgment was to disperse Babylon, to divide this people. And you know what it did is it made them a weaker people. It made them a weaker, I mean, so prior to this day, they thought their city was impenetrable by even God himself. But this weakened, and you know, a divided people is always weaker. Which is why people who cause division in the church need to be shown the door. Because that's what the word of God says, by the way, very clearly. Not to permit or allow divisive people because they weaken the body. They weaken the, the church. They weaken the community. So not unlike the judgment of Noah's day, right, where God judged mankind with the flood, he, he forced a restart, Right? Now there's just eight people left, and they have to sort of restart the whole civilization thing. Um, this judgment of Babel forces another kind of civilization-wide restart from everything from, like, the economy to family and to social systems. I mean, when he says he confused it, that means there were parents who couldn't communicate with their children. There were cousins who couldn't communicate with each other or their aunts or their uncles or different clans. I mean, this was just a, 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 a civilization-wide problem. And so it forced a restart from everything, from their economy to family to social systems. And, and this is really similar to the judgment on Nazi Germany after World War II, uh, when the Allies finally took Berlin, and they destroyed, in that moment, 
the national unity that once had existed in Germany, which created the, uh, the uh, conditions that made all of the atrocities of the Holocaust possible. Right? None of that could have been possible had not the nation kind of all went along with it. They had national unity in this thing, right? And then after the Allies took control of Berlin, you know what followed? Dispersion. Division. Eventually, Germany was divided into four what they called occupation zones. I think it was the French, the English, the Russians, and the United States. Each kind of oversaw a part of Germany. was divided up. And then most of you know it eventually became East and West Germany uh, with a wall that went through East and West Berlin. And that wall was there for another 28 years. So this wasn't just a short division. It wasn't a short, brief dispersal. And during those years... Germany went through a lot of suffering. They suffered periods of, of economic collapse and social collapse, uh, societal collapse. It took a lot of healing for that wall to finally come down in the 90s. And, you know, I just think Iran right now and maybe other countries uh, and entities that are hostile to Israel, maybe they should take note of all of these judgments. The days of Noah, the city of Babel, World War II. Maybe they should take notice because God will eventually bring judgment on all who persecute his people. Hard stop. He will eventually do those three things. Confuse them, destroy their prosperity, and disperse them. Now, if I were to stop right there, and that was the end of today's sermon, and dismiss you, You'd leave feeling like, man, that was a bummer. Right? That was no fun. All this judgment stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's heavy. It's, 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 it's ominous. See, there I go looking at those lights again and getting blind. Oh, man. All this judgment stuff. I mean, geez, he's talking about World War II and the Holocaust and justifying sin and the LGBT. QI plus thing and God wiping people out. So glad I came to church today. But stick with me for five more minutes because I'm not going to stop there. Because God is a God of restoration. Okay? Because you know what? I don't think you could preach on judgment without talking about restoration. So I want you to see this morning the wonderful connection between the judgment of God confusing the language in Babel, to the miracle at Pentecost. Because there's a really interesting connection between those two things. Because on the day of Pentecost, God poured out a new language, a new spiritual vernacular that brought a dispersed people, all separated by language and clan, brought them together. See, at Babel, God broke the unity of people, by bringing confusion through the judgment of their language. I've explained that already, how that worked and the results. So let's fast forward to the day of Pentecost. God is a God of restoration. I mean, most of you are familiar with these events uh, because we talk about them a lot in the Pentecostal church. But let me just recap what's going on in this moment of history. Prior to the day of Pentecost uh, that we read about in Acts chapter 2, an innocent, sinless Jesus, the Son of God, is crucified in Jerusalem. The prophecies of the Old Testament tell us that he did this willingly like a lamb to the slaughter. Not to pay, by the way, a price for any sin of his own because he didn't have any, but because he paid the price for us who did have it. Right? He did this because it's God's desire that even those who are rebellious and resistant and even defiant for a time would eventually repent and accept his free gift of salvation so that anybody who's far from God could, could be restored to him. That's God's hope. That's God's plan. That's God's desire. He died to pay the price for our sins so that you and I, through faith in him, could be forgiven of those sins. Why? God is a God of restoration. Three days later, Jesus rose from the grave to prove that he is who he says he is. He has the power to do that. 
He has the power to forgive and restore people to a right relationship with Father. His resurrection proved it. And before ascending to heaven, he made a promise. And that promise was to send the Holy Spirit to work in our lives and give us power to live for him in this world. He described it as a total immersion in the Holy Spirit. He called it the the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who would fill us and, and give us power from on high to be his witnesses in this world. And the darker the world gets, the more we need his power. So that you and I will be empowered to to share the good news and see people who are far from God be restored to a right relationship with him. Because he's the God of restoration. I looked at that bumper sticker about in the beginning man created God and I was offended and I was angry and it, it irritated me. And I remembered that person driving that car is far from God. God wants to restore that person to a right relationship with him. So Jesus tells his disciples, go and wait. Just go wait, Jerusalem. You don't know what it's going to look like, but it's, something's going to happen. That was his promise. And then in Acts chapter 2, we find the disciples doing just that. They're in the upper room. They're just worshiping. They're waiting. Maybe they're praying. They're talking. They're eating. Who knows what they're doing? And here's what it tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived... They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now that's the part most of you know, and that's the part most people think about When they think about the day of Pentecost, the miraculous gift of speaking in tongues, it's poured out on the day of Pentecost, giving birth to what we know today, right, as the Pentecostal church. We believe in the Pentecostal church because we've experienced it, that the gifts of God are still being poured out on his church. We believe that. We experience it. 100%. We see miracles. Okay, just like Cindy's uh, bit this morning. I don't know if you caught the whole thing she was saying, but it was God moving in miraculous timing to overcome something that they didn't see coming. But God saw it coming, and he already had a means of providing for that crisis. We see miracles like that all the time because God is still a miracle-working God, is he not? Right? And if you don't believe that, by the way, they, something just happened, lights just went off. Don't lean on the wall. Uh, if you don't believe that, that God is a miracle-working God, then you probably don't believe in the God who created the world and everything there is that was created because the Bible reminds us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he created the heavens and the earth and he healed Jairus' daughter and the man with the withered hand made the lame walk, multiplied food to feed thousands upon thousands. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't stopped being, in other words, a miracle working God, okay? And look how, he, look how he does it in this example. This is so encouraging. At Babel, God confused language as a judgment, you know, as a way to disperse a stubborn people, a prideful people. But then in Acts chapter 2, he takes a dispersed people, divided, separated people from all over the known world at the time who clearly didn't know each other's language. It's the whole point of this thing, right? They didn't know each other's language and God brings them together by restoring to them a new language, a new common spiritual dialect, a new vernacular that allows them to find a new unity that unity that was crushed at Babylon, right? New connection in the things of the Spirit. And and, and look at what they say about it in verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. Right? So these are different people from all different parts of the known world. They might have all been Jews, and they had that in common, so there was some kind of loose unity there, but they couldn't communicate really very well with one another. They didn't know how to speak each other's languages, and this is the result, again, of the judgment at Babel as God dispersed the stubborn offspring of generations of Noah's sons. 
Verse 6, and at this sound, the multitude came together, and they would be, we were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language, and they were all amazed and astonished, and they started calling out, like, how is it that we hear all these people that are, don't speak my language speak in my language? It was crazy. All of a sudden, there's this amazing communication, and there's a whole list of, of places and, and languages that go on here. Our God is a God of restoration. This is why tongues is such a powerful gift. It's about restoration. You ever pray, but you just don't know what to pray? God gave you this gift to restore to you the ability to speak to him. Because it restores to us a connection to the Lord that Adam and Eve, they had it. When the Bible says they walked with him in the garden and they had intimate conversation. Can you imagine that? Intimate conversation with the God of the universe just walk around the garden? And this spiritual language, this renewal, it unifies the church today in a really powerful and special, similar sort of way. Because here's the deal. You can't speak in tongues in front of one another if you don't have unity. Right? Because you're just going to feel self-conscious and weird and crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, Next week, go visit a Methodist church and start praying in tongues out loud. See what happens. Okay? But together, we are in unity. We believe in the gifts. We believe in miracles that God is the same yesterday, today, forever. We don't need to be self-conscious. We don't need to be concerned or, or feel strange or feel crazy. Some of you still do, but I hope that that will end by the time you leave here today. Because I want you to see this. The gift of tongues restores some of what was lost at Babel. Its purpose is to really to bring the body together in power to be Christ's witnesses to the world. And I believe this. This is, this is my deep conviction. I believe God is going to use the Pentecostal church to bring restoration to his body. And, and don't misunderstand what I just said. It, uh, not that the Pentecostal church is like, you know, is always right, uh, you know, or, or better than any other church. I, I'm not saying that. But listen, what the church needs right now is the power of God working in and, and through her. And the Pentecostal church, we're, we're just more open to that, you know. And I, and I believe God is calling the Pentecostal church specifically when I say the Pentecostal church, I'm talking about the church of God, of course, but, you know, the assemblies of God and the church of God of prophecy and the church of God in Christ. I mean, there's a lot of Pentecostal, you know, bodies out there who believe and in practice and receive the gifts of the Spirit, who walk in the daily miracles of God, right? I believe that God is calling the true remnant of Jesus in all of those places from every corner of the Christian church, but that he's calling the Pentecostal church in particular, to be a catalyst for Holy Spirit-driven revival. And if you don't think this can happen, I want you to remember that God can pour out His Spirit on any people at any time. Unlike the Babylonians, we don't get to decide. It's not really about us. God is a God of restoration. I tell you, even in my own life, I came to the things of Pentecost because of some Catholic charismatics I used to hang out with. We used to get together with them, and it was back in the hippie days, and uh, we used to sit around in a circle of bare feet and play hippie songs on guitar, and, and that's how I learned to play acoustic guitar, you know, and, and uh, they would speak in tongues and pray in the spirit and all that kind of stuff, and, and they were Catholics, you know, but there's a remnant in every corner of the Christian church, okay? So whether you need this morning to come to the Lord for the first time or you need to return time to come back because you, you've drifted far. Or maybe this morning your desire is to be filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues. I don't really know. Let me just say about that real quick. I get it. I get how that feels to feel like, man, if I were to speak in tongues in front of somebody here, they would think I was crazy. I'm going to feel self-conscious. I'm going to feel very weird. What if I do it wrong? What if it's fake? All those other concerns. Would you just would you just Allow God to break that wall down. 
That's part of the wall I talked about at the very beginning of this message. That wall needs to come down. Because all that is is your own self-concern. You know what self-concern is? Pride. We must not allow our pride to get in the way of what God wants to do. So if you've never received that, and you don't, if you've never felt comfortable coming forward, maybe today's your day. I know everybody here doesn't speak in tongues, so why not? Can you imagine how much more unified and powerful it would be as a church if we were all kind of walking in the same direction, receiving of the Spirit in the same way? Because God is a God of restoration. So even if you're far from him, he wants to bring you near. If you've drifted from him, maybe you've been struggling with some sort of sin that you've kept secret and you don't think anybody knows about, God knows. And that's part of your wall. And God wants to break that wall down today. If that's you and you need to be restored You need to be cleansed of that sin once and for all. You need to make a new commitment. God, I'm going to walk away from this sin with your help. I'm going to stay clean from it. Or if you want to go further in the things of the Spirit, here's one thing I know, because I know some of you are concerned. Well, I don't really know if this baptism of the Spirit speaking to things is for everybody. I will just tell you one thing I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God wants to fill you. The Lord's just speaking that to my heart right now. He's speaking that to my mind right now about some of you. He wants to fill you. That much we know. But the question is, is do you want to be filled? And are you open to a move of God? Even if it's a little intimidating, don't be intimidated. As a matter of fact, I will remove some percentage of your intimidation right now, let me just ask you, how many people in this room right now pray in tongues on a regular basis? Look around, everybody. Take take a good look around. It's a lot of us. If there's one group of people you don't need to be nervous about that gift with and in front of, it's the Pentecostal church. Okay? So this morning, I just just want to invite you, uh, if we can pray with you, We've got a few people who, who are going to come forward and, and, and just lay their hand on you and pray with you. Or if you need someone to talk with about something that you're struggling and you want somebody to pray with you about something in specific, we'll be happy to do that. If you want to pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, listen, we're not going to tell you to start saying certain words. Just begin to pray out loud. Pray out loud and let God do the rest. And One of my favorite TV shows I happened to be watching this past week, one of the characters was asked if if he felt guilty for something that he had done. And he said, you know what? I don't do guilt. I don't have time for guilt. I don't have time for shame. Well, you know what? I don't have time for self-consciousness in the church. I don't have time for that. So don't you have time for it either because it's demonic. It's orchestrated to keep you from receiving of God. So don't do it. We just want to pray with you. God moves. Don't worry about feeling self-conscious or strange or weird. Just speak out what the Lord is is putting into your your mouth and and let God do the rest. And don't second guess and doubt if it's God. Okay? Because here's what I know. God wants to fill you. Others here, God wants to restore. 